those of you that are familiar, something that caught quite a bit of the headlines, or at least on social media, I would say a landmark event for humanity as a whole. And it's raised questions. People have asked, and they've asked about Islamic permutations to those questions. And that is, people, xenon transplantation. Okay. What are we talking about? What we're talking about is in in recent weeks we've experienced as humans, as humanity has witnessed, a successful pig, pig's heart, so porcine heart transplant into a human in America successfully. This is such a significant event. It is incredibly um, illuminating. So it's it's given rise to all kinds of discussions. That is that possible, which it is. And and then what is this about? What has happened? And is this halal? So so is this something that the person could accept as a donor? Could they accept a porcine heart? So let's briefly just tackle that and then unpack it more as we go through it you see we have to understand and i've got a detailed video on the incremental um evolutionary um or developmental ruling or perspective on pork through the abrahamic faiths so if you watch that it is a detailed video i go through the the so-called developmental journey through the Abrahamic faiths of pork and pre, um, you know, mosaic law. So, what? How was pork viewed in um, in the recent millennia, coming right up to our time and Islam, and what led to its tahrim? So, okay. The other thing I would highlight is that pork is the only clear um, animal that has we've been told in the Quran not to consume. And I've got a detailed video explaining a perspective on why that may be the case. Sure, people may have other opinions, but I've got a detailed video and you're more than welcome to. And in fact, please do watch that. It is not talking about pigs as a um, some kind of a cursed creature from God. They are not. So how have the scholars viewed pig in and of itself? In Islam, and we'll speak uh, shortly on a follow-up topic, which is to do with different, how scholars view different meat within Islam and what is halal and haram. But pig, especially in the school of Medina, that is Imam Malik's school, it is a pure creature. All creatures are pure by default in according to the school of Medina, according to Imam Malik and the knowledge he inherited in Medina. So life necessitates purity. No animal is impure. So a dog is not impure according to Imam Malik's madhab. Uh, neither is a pig. So if a pig drank from a bowl, sure, you don't have to drink that bowl. And maybe because you, we may have a cultural... Um, kind of um, aversion to pigs and therefore we may find uh, it disgusting because let's say that's how we view and some people may do that with different animals just as they may find other creatures maybe they have a kind of they find it nauseating for them based on their cultural practices that's absolutely fine that is your personal cultural reaction however According to the school of Medina, Imam Malik's madhab, no animal is najas. No animal. 
And the hadith to do with when the dog licks a bowl and it should be washed. And I've got a detailed video on that as well. The Imam Malik clearly highlights that, yes, that hadith is there, but maybe we don't understand why it's come. And he says, maybe it's, and this is why he, he just says that. And some of the Maliki say, maybe he was just speaking about hygiene. Now, there is a difference between hygiene and between being pure. So, for example, somebody can, somebody or something can carry germs. They can carry diseases. They can carry poison. There's a lot of reasons why some creatures you may want to either keep a distance or you don't want them uh, mixing with your kind of, especially food items. For many reasons, it's not that they are najas in Islam. So poison, for example, in Islam is haram to consume. It is not najas. So the same thing with, let's say, uh, bacteria. Dogs licking a bowl. Uh, many of the Maliki ulama said that they felt that maybe what they're alluding to is that maybe the dogs in that time had rabies. And this was perhaps why the gradual incremental development of that ruling. But it's not that the dog is nudges, but they say, sure, you can spill the water and wash the bowl and do that. But let's get back to the discussion on all animals are pure by default and they remain pure. That doesn't mean you can eat. I mean, OK, we're going to come to that discussion, but it doesn't necessitate you eat something just because it's not nudges. And the example is poison, for example. It is poison is pure in islam it's not considered like if you had poison in your pocket and you prayed your salah is absolutely fine it is not an invalid salah but to consume the poison would be haram so it is not always and similarly with let's say heroin heroin in and of itself is it's not a nudges product. It's not if a person had heroin in their pocket and they decide to go into a mosque and pray, their salah would be valid. But to consume heroin would be haram. So you see, there there is not a we shouldn't. There's not always this understanding of if something is haram, it must be impure. Now I accept other schools of law may have looked at that differently and will and they do other schools of law have thought because the pig is declared haram and najas uh sun in the quran um that this must be because it is impure okay and so there is a difference between the schools and sure if you follow that school where you feel that uh, several animals are najas because in the Quran Allah also says about the mushrikun innam al mushrikun and najas that they are najas the polytheists now many ulama most ulama did not understand this literally they did not say that the the that mushrikeen are actually najas because bani adam insan are generally by mo by many ulama are generally considered always pure even if they themselves may be in a state of impurity, but they are pure. So, for example, their touch, their saliva, things like this are not considered impure by many ulama of Islam. So if you drank something, this concept of, you know, what they say sometimes, jutta, like where people say su'ar in Arabic, that what is left behind, that if somebody drinks something and they leave it behind in... In India and by extension Pakistan, because they influence with in the subconscious, the collective conscious, sub, collective consciousness, it carries that cultural baggage of casteism, of these are lower castes and we can't mix and these people are impure and these people are najas. So many Muslims too don't drink. Uh, you know, they they call it like the jutta of someone. We don't drink the leftover from someone because it's considered bad. But the hadith says that the su'ar, especially of a believer, is shifa, su'ar al-mu'min shifa. But yet, many Muslims don't do it, but that's culture. So, the su'ar in and of itself is not impure. Yes, if a person's been drinking alcohol or doing something like that, that's a different ruling. That's not a default ruling. So let's get back to life necessitates purity, according to especially the madhab of Imam Malik and school of Medina. So all living creatures are always pure. Dead creatures may be impure. Now that's a difference, you see, because life 
is the element that keeps everything pure. And that's an important point. So just to understand that, okay? So secondly, in the Quran, we are told about lahm al khinzir. Allah says lahm al khinzir, eating the meat of pig, right? Allah uses the name of the creature. This creature is not hated by God, okay? I think it's it's unfortunate that Muslims think that this is somehow a hated creature. God hates. God doesn't, obviously, God created it. It doesn't, it is not, to Allah, all creatures are equal. You know, they're not like, sure, there's wisdom in don't eat a snake for a particular reason or don't eat a pig for the reason or the wisdoms that Allah may have put in it. But it doesn't mean God hates this creature, okay? So Allah does use the word for pig. And the reason I'm saying this is because I know as kids, we weren't allowed to say the word pig. And we, we used to always avoid saying it, it would go big. <laughs> when we were in school and we had to read something, we'd go, uh oh, it's, we can't say the word. P-I-G, we used to say. <laughs> <laughs> we used to think it's haram, but the word khinzir is in the Quran on several occasions. Allah says, Lahma khinzir, it comes in the Quran. So it's not a haram word, just so we know that. Now, Allah says, turra. You see, whosoever is in a state of desperation, let's say you're starving, you are uh you're going somewhere, you're starving, you don't have Allah says they can eat swine meat. If you're starving and you've got nothing, and turra, whosoever is forced, as in they have some, they can eat it. Allah is saying they can eat it, not me or you. Allah is saying, hey, eat it. Why? Because life is always paramount. Always. These things will come and go. These things are not. Life is precious. فَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا Whosoever preserves a life فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا As though he has preserved the entirety of mankind. See, so that Allah is telling you, make that choice. Sure, a person, if the, but Allah is saying, in that state, even pig is not haram for you. And that's to eat. So now you fast forward, if you are in a state where you, your life could be saved by taking an organ from a pig, should you take it? Yes, of course. Of course you should take it. Right? The, the, this will preserve life. Okay. So that's just a uh, an understanding. For, for, so if anybody is confused, that first of all, is a pig pure? And then I've highlighted that, yes, there is a debate within uh, Sunni Islam, but with a strong pioneering school of Ahlul Sunnah, that is the school of Medina, coming from the descendants, from the descendants of, of, the, of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, in Medina. And that is Imam Malik teaching you that, yes, all animals are always pure because life necessitates purity. Second question, well, if you had to eat swine meat, you had to eat pork because you were almost starving to death or you were in a state of desperation, can you do it? The Quran teaches you to do it. Why? Because life is always paramount. So, okay. If you can save people's lives by manipulating um, pigs and especially pig organs and you can save lives then yes of course so that's what i want to share now just a bit more about this those of you that don't know this this pioneering uh project so a bit before by the way so so just a uh, a slight tangential note for decades people have been experimenting in fact for maybe a century or two people have been experimenting with trying to save humans with animal organs so you'll get um almost 100 years ago people had tried it they had tried taking some for example 
uh, monkey organs and trying to uh, place them into a human in some kind of surgery. But it often just resulted in um, very immediate collapse, failure and death. OK, so you do have certain incidents where people have tried that. Then leading up into the 60s, there were several attempts that people um, there was an attempt where I believe up to 13 people had uh, baboon kidneys placed into them. And and some of them, um, but but they it just led to very rapid failure and and death. And there was there has been attempts to for a heart transplant in the 60s as well with a chimpanzee heart. But within just a couple of hours, the person died. And then I believe in the 90s, there was a an attempt that was successful. I believe it may have been a baboon heart, but it was successful for several um or was it sorry that was a liver but for several months but then it kind of collapsed and and the issue has that is the issue that has arisen is usually that the human immune system you see people for for quite some while have thought that look there is similarities between certain organs that animals have and humans like chimpanzees may have and pigs and different kind of uh, mammals may share certain similarities in their kidneys and in their hearts. And so if we replace, even though with the chimpanzee heart, the heart that the, uh, the operation done several decades ago was far too small. But besides that, there's other issues of blood groups. And then there's the key central issue that the human immune system will attack the foreign uh, organ because it sees it as a foreign element and it will start to attack it and then even if it resists momentarily it will eventually break down to the immune uh, to the immune response from the human so what we have now was that this team this pioneering medical team they genetically modified the pigs to be able to um to resist the organs to resist the human human immune attack so when it's in the body it wouldn't be broken down by the immune response from the body now this whole program which was pioneered in america was undertaken by a muslim it was actually led and pioneered by a muslim doctor a Pakistani Muslim doctor. So this, I believe he's uh, part of Maryland Medical University. His name is Dr. Muhammad Muhyiddin. And you've got his profile right there and you can see it online. He pioneered this whole program and he's somebody who studied himself in Karachi and I believe uh, developed a lot of experience there and then moved to the United States. And he's been part of this uh, Zeno transplantation and then successfully, for the first time, delivered on what is this uh, this pig to human heart transplant. And this changes everything. Um, it really changes everything. Because as you can see, the, 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 the options are almost limitless. I mean, we're talking from lungs to kidneys to liver to retina to cornea to eye transplant to skin grafting so many things uh the future holds just it is so bright because they, they obviously we have to see the outcome of this in maybe the months and years to come that this heart is not uh kind of rejected and it's successful because all they have to do is genetically modify the pig, its particular organ, and then there you go. It's good to go. And transplant it straight into the human. And it will save millions, millions of lives worldwide. I mean, it is absolutely mind boggling because you see pigs. And one of the question may be why? Uh, why pigs? Because, you know, one of the questions, I don't know if that many people may think, I was thinking anyways, why not chimpanzees? 
I mean, are they not? And they're not actually a better, <laughs> and I'll show you why. This is a, you can see here, a, um, a chart here. We're just showing, comparing, juxtaposing pigs with primates. And you can see things like, um, so for example, with a baboon, where the size of adult organs are actually inadequate to a pig. And the length of the pregnancy, look at the distinction. And then, so, and how soon it can reproduce where a pig period of rep uh, to reproductive maturity is within four to eight months where a baboon, three to five years. The breeding potential of pigs is, is very good compared to baboons. Uh, you're looking at the cost of maintenance is significantly lower. Um, now, also the fact that pigs have many piglets, they, they, the whole litter of piglets are being born. Whereas with primates, you're only dealing with one. It's not. So you're having an entire litter that is being designed accordingly. And unlike primates, see, pigs can live in very controlled environments. Like, you set up the, the pig barn and it's it's not difficult to maintain them and control. Whereas chimpanzees are very, or baboons or primates are very kind of, um, even if they can be kept in confinement, but they are very animated creatures. They are not the kind to just stay there and just munch and, you know, they need to be jumping around and they need to be jumping on all these trees and, and they need larger areas as well to stay in and they and they stay in tribes as well they're not just really um so when you're looking at and how long does it take the gestation period for them to give birth and then how soon after can they give birth and what is for them to arrive at the age of giving birth they have to be so many years old and then they just it, you're looking at one and then how long that's going to take and even the environment of the pregnancy because it's how how the chimp or the primate has to be kept they're still very they're kind of um um very lively which and there's an element of unpredictability with primates whereas with pigs very controlled they rapidly reach an age of reproductive maturity they give birth to multiple offspring uh, the organ sizes are actually larger. So it's certain, like a chimpanzee, its heart size, even though its anatomy is in many ways more similar to human uh, humans, but the size of the organs are often slightly smaller, some organs, like the heart as an example and things. So you can see here, wow, and pigs are in no short supply because they mass reproduce. Unlike chimpanzees, if you started just killing chimpanzees around the world, you, you wouldn't have many chimpanzees left. Whereas pigs, that you would just have these mass, mega kind of pig farms that would just manufacture them, genetically modify them, and they would be alive. You see, the thing with organ transplant is often a person death is unpredictable. So when a person dies you have to have the organs removed within that lifetime. So, so before there is organ death. And that's difficult and it has to be removed and then taken to the recipient within that couple of hours. Whereas in this case, you would have the pig that is alive and the organ would be removed whilst it's alive. And, and there you go. I mean, you know, whilst in a, in a state of it being alive and then under anesthesia, and then it would be directly transplanted to the human. And this is going from things like we're looking, possibly, it's, it's limitless. We're looking at skin grafting. We're looking at things like eyes, the cornea. We're looking at things like uh, the heart, lungs, potentially. You're looking at elements like uh, kidneys, liver. It's just amazing if these things become so rapidly available. Do you know the waiting lists? are that they are out of control in many parts of the world. So I think this is a huge blessing. And I felt, I have to say, really proud that this, that the pioneer 
to all of these um, was a Muslim. I don't know. I just felt that, wow, that's, to me, that, that was like just incredibly impressive. Uh, I hope he is uh, celebrated. Uh, you know, I, I definitely, I'm sure, obviously he is in the United States, but I'm sure because this is a moment of immense pride for the Muslim world that because the, the, maybe humanity has now embarked on a new chapter for human health and its longevity, and that too pioneered by Dr. Muhammad Mahiyuddin. You know, may Allah bless him and uh, reward him. He's in infinitely, I believe, the in Maryland uh, within the United States. If anybody that watches this is in touch with him, um, definitely reach out extend our love and ask him would he would he would he like to come onto mind trap <laughs> we would love to have that discussion with him so right that's um yeah brain transplant imagine uh losing a loved one only to have them revived <laughs> imagine that huh brain transplants when they come along I'm telling you the world we are witnessing history in the making. Ladies and gentlemen, it is happening. I'm telling you. Somebody said, kind of ironic, they think we hate pigs and then this happens. Yeah, <laughs> we don't hate pigs. I get it that there's a cultural um, aversion uh, to, to them, but that's, but it's not. We don't hate them, or we shouldn't hate in that sense. If if people do, uh, they should come to understand that you know we don't need to hate something just because it's haram, and it is often a matter of perspective. A digital world, um, it is indeed. It's a digital world. You're having uh, Imam Trump has asked, "Is transplanting sexual organs halal?" <laughs> have you seen the there's an interview of i believe he's i actually i believe he's muslim as well i could be wrong but i'm sure i recall him as also uh south asian and i believe in the uk he so this this guy who's having an interview right he's having an interview about for some reason, I don't know what the what the injury was or whether it was a um, just a kind of congenital uh, defect or what it was. But he's I've forgotten now, but he, his um, the male appendage, shall we say, wasn't working. And so or I think it was missing or it was maybe I think there was an accident. And God forbid, what an. On an accident, that's like Astaghfirullah. <laughs> that's like DNR. Do not resuscitate. <laughs> it's like so. God forbid, Allah. <laughs> right. So there's. So I think it was an accident, and he he loses his appendage <laughs> for <laughs> as a better word, and what they do is they provide him a new one. <laughs> And 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 they're asking him in the interview about the the, the size. Would you did you get to choose the size or did you get? <laughs> and he has it, if I recall correctly, with a kind of like a switch, which is implanted by the kind of scrotum, where he can press the switch and it just kind of it just stands to attention. <laughs> it's responsive, shall we say? It's digitally responsive. <laughs> Imagine that's on wireless now. So it must be now on wireless. It must be like phone activated. <laughs> it's like a facial recognition. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mistake. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mistake. Sorry. Sorry, man. I was trying. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, not now. Switch off. <laughs> so, yeah. What uh, somebody said, I wonder whether getting a new heart would increase your life expectancy. <laughs> of course it would. <laughs> oh, you mean if you're a normal, healthy person? 
Well, if you're a normal, healthy person, I don't know. Because I'm sure there's many complications with getting a new heart as well. But it's just that they, you know, the, the pros outweigh the cons if you're failing heart failure. I mean, if you're facing heart failure, obviously, if you've got a healthy heart already or reasonably healthy heart, I don't know whether that would be a wise choice, so to say. You might end up with, with a choice, power of choice, just in a new life as well, but not a pleasant one. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, stem cells is a whole new um, area as well. I just... Wow, I just, I, you know, it's amazing what's happening around the world. Honestly, it's amazing. 